Welcome to another episode of Preferred Walk On, PFF's college football show. I'm your host, Max Chowdick, alongside my co host, Dalton Wasserman, producer Eli, back there in the studio as well. Got a very special episode today, Dalton, kind of putting a bow on the 2023 college football season with our top 101 players from the 2023 college football season using all of the PFF grades, advanced metrics that we have that you can't find anywhere else. Uh, so you can find them actually at pff.com if you want to make a subscription to there. I highly recommend it. So that way you can make your own list and compare it to ours. But yeah, Dom, it's been an unreal college football season. Uh, coming up with this list, man, we hopped on a call. Uh, just kind of break it down. So I have a, my Zoom account can only let me do 45-minute meetings at a time. I think we did like five separate Zoom meetings because we just had to keep going through this and arguing about where guys should be on this list. Very difficult, man, but we came up with our top 101 players. I'm excited to uh, unveil it to the people now. Oh, yeah. Nar narrowing it down to 101 is tough, and uh, and putting them in whatever order we want to put them in is hard, too. There's a lot of guys and, and a lot of, you know, we don't, I think we had a lot of arguments even about positional value. It yeah. felt like we had a million running backs that we could have put on here, and and we did, especially in the back half of this list. There was there, This was not, especially making the order of this, this was not easy at all just because there's so many great players. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, listen, we have 101 players to go over right now. So let's just jump right into it uh, with our 101 to 76 list. So we'll talk about that first. At number 101 is Xavier Watts, the safety from Notre Dame. At number 100 is Jatavion Sanders, the tight end from Texas. 99, Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver from LSU. 98, cornerback Jerrion Jones from Florida State. At number 97, Xavier Nwankba, the, uh, the safety from Iowa. At number 96 is Jalen Green, the edge from Matt, uh, James Madison. Number 95, Kamon Rucker, edge from North Carolina. 94, wide receiver Ricky White from UNLV. At number 93, Chris Braswell, the edge from Alabama. 92, Quinton Cooley, the running back from Liberty. At number 91, uh, defensive tackle Chris Jenkins from Michigan. Number 90, another Michigan guy, center Drake Nugent. Uh, at number 89 now, Kelvin Banks Jr., the offensive tackle from Texas. 88, Roman Williams. Wilson, the wide receiver from Michigan. 87, another Michigan guy, Josh Wallace, the cornerback. Uh, 86, the safety from Oregon State, Keaton Oladapo. Uh, Keaton Oladapo, excuse me. Uh, 85, Xavier Leggett, the wide receiver from South Carolina. 84, Kamari Lassiter, cornerback from Georgia. 83, Kamani Vidal, the running back from Troy. 82, Dolan's guy, Aeneas Peebles, defensive tackle at Duke, who actually just transferred to Virginia Tech. 81, Kyle Monengai, the running back from Rutgers. 80, Kevin Winston Jr., safety of Penn State. 79, Hunter Wilder, the safety from Wisconsin. 78, Tez Johnson, wide receiver, Oregon. Uh, and 77, Jackson Dart, quarterback, Ole Miss. And 76, Michael Barrett, linebacker from Michigan. We apologize to our viewers who see that list up on the screen right now. I read off all those names for our audio-only listeners who want to know the entire list. That's why I'm doing that right there. So I, I appreciate you guys bearing with me through that. But, Dolan, who do you want to highlight in that 101 to 76 range? Yeah, definitely get you some air there, Max. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to the very last guy on our list, the Nagurski Award winner Xavier Watts. Now, it might seem funky that he won that award and he's this far low on the list, but uh, 72.8 overall grade. Had a little bit of struggle in run defense, hovering with uh, about a 62 in there. But this guy's excellent in coverage for Notre Dame. A 75.1 coverage grade, seven interceptions, led the country. Two against Caleb Williams and USC, along with an 88 run defense great in that game the best game of his career he had a stretch of three games where he had five interceptions across the three of them um i, I think the big highlight for watts for me more so than the award and the interceptions that he's another fantastic player at notre dame coming back i mean kaiser cross mills they get rod Hurd transferring in there who yeah. i went over last week they're they are so loaded on defense i mean notre dame really with Watts and everybody coming back, has a chance to be the best defense in the country, and he deserves a lot of credit for what he does in coverage for them. Has a ton of range on the back end. Yeah, don't forget about uh, Ben Morrison too, the cornerback who true. you know was he was a superstar as a true freshman, still played really well as a sophomore, but he could be a first round pick too. So I mean, yeah, that Notre Dame defense, man, probably a top three to five defense in college football heading into next year. I mean, they are phenomenal. Uh, and what they have. So a uh, guy I want to talk about is Tez Johnson, the Oregon receiver who was phenomenal at Troy in 2022. Um, and they actually transferred to Oregon this past season to play with his adopted brother in Bo Nix, who he grew up with, went to the same high school as him. And in our interview with Bo Nix, you, you can check out if you haven't watched it already, Bo actually talked about Tez and he said, yeah, Tez actually, when we were growing up, 
always wanted to go to Oregon. That was always his dream school. Didn't get an offer from Oregon out of high school, so he went to Troy, killed it at Troy, and they joined uh, Bo Nix at Oregon this year. Um, and he really, man, it wasn't like he just got offered from Oregon just because he's Bo Nix's adopted brother. He was phenomenal for the Ducks this year. Led the Power Five with 727 yards after the catch and had 3.45 yards per route run. That only trailed Malik Neighbors among Power Five receivers. Bo Nix is off to the NFL draft right now, but Tez Johnson is not following him. He's actually going to stay in Eugene uh, and be Dylan Gabriel, one of his top targets next year. Maybe not the top target with Evan Stewart going there, but Tez Johnson might honestly be the top target. We'll see. Uh, but Oregon's got a really nasty receiving core, and Tez Johnson uh, is a big, big reason for that. He should be one of the top receivers in college football heading into next season. All right, let's go over to our 75 to 51 players once again. So at number 75 is Michael Jurgens, the offensive guard from Wake Forest. 74, offensive tackle Patrick Paul from Houston. 73, edge defender Jonah Ellis from Utah. 72, Mike Samer still the corner from Michigan. 71, Christian Haynes, offensive guard from UConn. 70, Jay Higgins, linebacker from Iowa. 69, Clay Webb, the offensive guard from Jacksonville State. 68, Jack Kaiser, the linebacker from Notre Dame. 67, Dylan Thieneman, the safety from Purdue. Fantastic true freshman safety for Purdue this year. Uh, 66, Taj Brooks, the running back from Texas Tech. 65, Ashton Ginty, the running back from Boise State. 64, Quincy Riley, lockdown corner for Louisville this year. 63, Malachi Starks, the safety from Georgia. 62, Bucky Irving, running back from Oregon. 61, Travis Hunter, the corner slash wide receiver from Colorado. 60, Jordan Travis, the quarterback from Florida State, uh, who really was the only reason why Florida State didn't make the playoff this year is because he got hurt. So that just shows you how valuable he was to the Seminoles this year. 59, Ben Sinat, the tight end from Kansas State. 58, Jonathan Brooks, running back from Texas. 57, Shador Sanders, quarterback Colorado. Uh, 56, Cooper DeJean, the corner from Iowa. 55, another Big Ten corner, Will Johnson from Michigan. 54, Troy Franklin, wide receiver from Oregon. 53, another Pac-12 receiver, Tetsuro McMillan from Arizona. Uh, 52, Will Campbell, the offensive tackle from LSU, and another tackle at 51 in Olu Fashano. All right, so from 75 to 51, Dolan, who do you want to talk about in that range? You know, I'll tell you, this was a hard choice because there's a ton of big, big names, some of the biggest names in college football in this group. But I'm, I'm going to go, one of the themes here I noticed on the back end of this list was Big Ten safeties, just a ton of, I, the Big Ten is just loaded with safeties and now you got Caleb Downs coming into Ohio State yeah. but I'll tell you what I gotta love the freshman Dylan Thieneman from Purdue man I'm gonna tell you something true just single high center field free safety at times that lines up I'm Max I'm telling you 25 30 30 yards off the ball I, I think he has more range than any than any safety in the country as a freshman six interceptions this year plays to play that far back and to be trusted so often in a single high center field role like that. I sideline to sideline range. And from that far back, put up a 90 run defense grade and the best overall grade in the country as a freshman. Dylan Feeneman at Purdue is the centerpiece of their secondary. And, and I, I, I'm telling you, his his range, I don't think yet like he's as versatile as as some of the other like Caleb Downs and say like we've seen Kyle Hamilton before, but he has as much range as any safety I've seen in college football the last couple of years, a true single high ball hawk center fielder at Purdue that we need to keep watching out for the next couple of years. Dude, this safety position is, I would argue, is the best position, at least defensively, in college football heading into next year with everything you got coming back. And a lot of the guys coming back to the Big Ten, too. I mean, Kevin Winston Jr., Penn State safety coming back. Caleb Downs, you mentioned. Dylan Thieneman. Uh, Dylan Thieneman, coming out of high school, was the number 966 player in the country, number 90 safety in the country coming out of high school. And he was immediately uh, one of the best safeties in the country this year as a true freshman. So the kind of the recruiting rankings probably got that wrong. But Dylan Thieman, man, he's a stud for Purdue. And uh, big for Purdue, honestly, you see a guy like that uh, play that well at a school like Purdue – as a true freshman, usually they might get some offers in the tr for a transfer portal, you know, getting the, in the portal. Purdue keeping him right now. So big, big time by them keeping him there. Uh, a guy I wanted to talk about, 
another guy who's coming back to school next year is Will Campbell from LSU, the offensive tackle, who, for my money, is the number one tackle in college football heading his next year. There's going to be a really good debate, I think, between him and Kelvin Banks Jr., Texas' left tackle we went over already. Uh, but I think I would give the edge to Will Campbell right now. Last year, Will Campbell was a true freshman, started at left tackle for LSU as a true freshman, which is really difficult in the SEC especially. Um, and he had an 85.6 pass blocking grade on true pass sets, which was only behind Peter Skaronsky among Power 5 tackles last year. So Peter Skaronsky, top 15 pick in the draft, played pretty well for the Titans this year. Uh, and Will Campbell was the only one behind him in terms of pass blocking grade on true pass sets when Will Campbell was a true freshman that year. This year, Campbell was a dominant run blocker. He had an 84.9 run blocking grade, fifth among all tackles in the country as well. Also still really good in pass protection. Didn't allow a single sack all year on 470 pass blocking snaps. So he's heading to his true junior year. Probably a projected top 10, top 15 pick in the NFL draft. Uh, and for my money, I think he's the number one offensive lineman in college football heading into next year. And LSU's got a stud uh, at left tackle there. All right, we're in the top 50 now. So let's get to the top 50 with 50 to 26. Another tackle uh, here at 50 in J.C. Latham from Alabama. Another tackle after that in Jordan Morgan from Arizona at 49. 48, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., linebacker from Clemson. 47, cornerback Chris Abrams Drain from Missouri, 46. Quarterback Jalen Moreau from Alabama. At 45 is Blake Corum, the running back from Michigan. 44, Quinion Mitchell, the corner from Toledo, who is murdering it at the Senior Bowl right now. Uh, 43, Javon Foster, the offensive tackle from Missouri. 42, Dylan Gabriel, quarterback from Oklahoma. 41, Jared Verse, edge defender from Florida State. Another edge at 40 in Dallas Turner from Alabama. And another edge at 39 in Ashton Gelati from Louisville, 38, Peyton Wilson, linebacker from NC State, 37, national championship winning quarterback J.J. McCarthy from Michigan, 36, Cody Schrader, running back from Missouri, who won the Burlesworth Trophy this year as the best walk-on in college football, or best former walk-on in college football, so shout out to him here on Preferred Walk-On, uh, 35, Chop Robinson, the edge from Penn State, 34, another Big Ten edge in Jack Sawyer from Ohio State. 33, Malik Washington, wide receiver from Virginia. 32, Edgerin Cooper, linebacker from Texas A&M. 31, James Pierce Jr., the edge from Tennessee. 30, Howard Cross III, defensive tackle from Notre Dame. 29, Caleb Downs, the probably the only true freshman safety better than Dylan Thieneman this year from Alabama, who is now at Ohio State. Uh, 28, Sebastian Castro, the corner from Iowa. 27, O'Marion Hampton, running back North Carolina. And 26, Byron Murphy, the defensive tackle from Texas. So from 50 to 26, Dolan, who do you want to highlight there? Well, there's a lot of talent in that group, isn't yeah. there? Um, I I'll tell you what, I think a PFF favorite guy and a guy who's about to become a real favorite of a lot of people in draft in this draft season is Malik Washington from yep. Virginia. Um, the only reason, Max, he may not go in the top 50 is because he's five foot eight. He looks like a running back. But his skills as a receiver are off the charts. 99.9, .9, perfect 99.9 .9 grade on intermediate passes. He makes catches in traffic, forced an FBS leading 35 missed tackles as a receiver this year. He, he If he was 6'6", people would be saying he's the next Debo Samuel. That's that's exact. It's the exact play style. It's intermediate. It's in traffic. It's breaking tackles. He uh, The more I was watching him, actually last night I was watching him, he he looks like a running back, but he's got every receiver skill you could want. I, he's as dangerous a slot receiver as there was in the country this year and as there's going to be in the draft. His after-the-catch ability is off the charts, and he's tearing up the Shrine Bowl right now. This is – Malik Washington, I think, is the mid-round receiver to watch, and it's only because he's five foot eight. If he was six feet tall, you would see him go in the top 40 to 50, no question. Yeah, I do. I love Malik Washington. I, I would have had him maybe not a Blitnikoff finalist, but he would have been like my number four guy that year. I mean, he was phenomenal. He was great at Northwestern, too, uh, before transferring to Virginia this past season. He was phenomenal. So uh, I love Malik Washington. I agree with you. I think he's a big, big time sleeper uh, for the 2024 NFL draft. The guy I want to highlight here in this range is a guy that we talked about before, but I love, love him, man. I mean, uh, another guy like, like Will Campbell um, come back to school. 
Uh, James Pierce Jr., the edge defender from Tennessee. I, I think this guy is a top five pick in 2025. I think that he's a stud. Uh, 52 pressures, 13 sacks, two forced fumbles, pick six, um, 92.4 pass rushing grade. Only Liatu Latu, who we'll get to in a little bit, had a better pass rushing grade than James Pierce Jr. Uh, this past season. And he had around a 22% pressure rate as well um which i believe le i was second behind latu uh in terms of power five edges as well so james pierce jr the size the explosiveness the power speed to power i think is, is elite from him i think he's gonna be a top five pick in the draft he actually had the best pass uh pressure rate in the power five this year so james pierce jr man he was a monster for the volunteers and i think i think he is the best edge defender in college football heading into next year and i think he will be a top five pick which is how freaky his tools are and not only that he's a freak athlete he also produced at an elite level this year too you combine those two together i think you get a, a stud prospect uh in next year's draft okay let's get to 25 to 11 now uh, at number 25 is our guy, Cooper Beebe, the offensive guard from Kansas State. At number 24 is Tyler Newbin, safety from Minnesota. 23, Caleb Williams, quarterback from USC. 22, Drake May, quarterback from North Carolina. 21, Jerzon Newton, the defensive tackle from Illinois. 20, Luther Bird in the third, wide receiver from Missouri. 19, Terry on Arnold, corner from Alabama. 18, Mason Graham, defensive tackle from Michigan. 17, Jackson Powers Johnson, center from Oregon. 16, Audric Estime, running back Notre Dame. 15, Talisa Fawaga, offensive tackle from Oregon State. 14, Kool-Aid McKinstry, the uh, corner from Alabama. 13, Braylon Trice, edge defender from Washington. 12, Carson Beck, quarterback from Georgia. And 11, the Doak Walker Award winner, Ali Gordon from Oklahoma State, the running back. So from 25 to 11, Dolan, who do you want to highlight there? Well, that's a lot of talent you just named off again. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually I'm going to go to what's probably going to be the very top of the draft, and Caleb Williams at 23, man. Look, he, he got a lot of flack this year. USC didn't win as much as they probably should have. Uh, they didn't win a Pac-12 title either the last two years. But I'll tell you what, he still threw 30 touchdowns to only five interceptions and I believe 10 or 11 rushing touchdowns. Um, led the nation with a 94.3 clean pocket grade. Look, he was loose with the football under pressure and late in the play at times, really trying to play the hero ball, trying to make up for USC's really bad defense this year. Um, but Caleb Williams is still one of the most explosive players this year in college football. Uh, it's still a top five, five or six quarterback. Honestly, still a, a guy anybody would say is one of the most dangerous players in the country on any given play in any given game. Um, it, he's, look, other than probably the Notre Dame game, he was not the reason at all that USC had the year that they had. That's really the only game that got to him. They got pressure on him. He was loose with the football. And that's a concern. But I think the skill set, the play style, everything, you know, including the flaws, or the very few of them, looks so much like Patrick Mahomes. And that's what Mahomes looked like at Texas Tech, man. He was he was going to sling the ball around under pressure. And he was, he was never going to quit on a play. You know, obviously you have to rein it in a little bit in the NFL, but I, I don't think we can forget how darn good Caleb Williams is and, and why he's the main, you know, guy in consideration for the number one pick. Dude, it's so funny when people talk about Caleb Williams and even Drake may a group of this too, in that, uh, they look at their seasons and they say, man, they, you know, they had a down year, quote unquote down year. They still graded at a 90 plus level this year. Like that, they're still at 90 plus is elite elite. So um, two guys that quote unquote had a down year really wasn't that much of a down year. They just never really expanded on what they were last year, which was one of the best quarterback. Both of them were two of the top probably four quarterbacks in college football last year. Uh, I, I still think both he and Drake may are pretty clearly the top two guys. I know you uh, love Jane Daniels. Who we'll talk about in just a second, but um, um, I love both of them. I, I think people are kind of overrating how much of a down year it was for Caleb Williams and Drake May. Uh, you, it's not his fault. You know, Caleb Williams was, was kind of by himself in that USC team. And like you said, the only loss that I would really attribute to him was the Notre Dame game. Everything else was kind of on the defense, man. So uh, Caleb Williams is still elite last year, and I, I don't think he's being appreciated enough, honestly. Uh, I want to talk about my guy, Jerzon Newton, who was phenomenal. Uh, for Illinois once again this year was a terrific defensive tackle for Illinois last year uh, 43 regular season pressures tied for the power five lead he ended up I believe with about um, yeah 43 which is fourth uh, in the power five overall this year and then also a really good run defender too he had the sixth most run defense stops among power five D tackles this year with 25 so I think this guy's a top 15 pick I think he's the number one 
defensive tackle in the 2024 NFL Draft. Uh, check out the interview with him. Uh, he was phenomenal on the mic as well. Um, he is, he's really good, man. And, and, you know, you found the stat too, Dolan, I love. Last two seasons, only Power 5 D tackle who, have, who has a run defense and pass rushing grade over a 90. So the last two years, man, Drazan Noon has been an absolute stud. Uh, and I think he deserves to be a top 20 at least, but to, probably, in my opinion, top 15 pick in this year's draft. Okay, so we're going to break down the top 10 uh, kind of individually now. So we're going we're gonna to go each you know one by one in the top 10. Uh, I'll kick it off with our number 10 guy, who is probably the, uh, the number one uh, tight end in college football history, in my opinion, and that is Brock Bowers from Georgia. So Brock Bowers won the John Mackey Award this year, uh, given to the best tight end in college football. He's the only two-time winner ever of the John Mackey Award in its 24-year history. Despite missing three games this year due to injury and opt-out, he still led all FBS tight ends with 486 yards after the catch and had the most receiving yards among Power 5 tight ends this year. So, again, three-time All-American, three-time PFF All-American, three-time AP All-American. Uh, the only other tight end ever who's been a three-time All-American was Notre Dame's Ken McAfee back in the 70s, I believe. And McAfee played four years of college football. So I think Brock Bowers is the GOAT college football tight end. Uh, we mentioned it before. I, if I'm the uh, Los Angeles Chargers, I would take him in the NFL draft. I would love to see that. But uh, I, I love Brock Bowers, man. I think you know him being in the top 10, even though he missed three games due to injury, just shows how dominant of a player he is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to disagree with anything Bowers has done. He could go as high as fifth overall. And with all, with as much as Jim Harbaugh has used his tight ends both in the NFL and college, I think it's. I, I think it makes a ton of sense. Especially Herbert's never had a weapon like that out there. Um, they, he's he's so dynamic. It's hard to ignore. It's hard. It's hard to think he's not going to walk into the NFL and and be one of the best five or six tight ends and do possibly even more in his rookie year than Sam Laporta did this yeah. year. But Rolling, rolling ahead to number nine here. I've got the, uh, the big guy, Tavondre Sweat from Texas, man. I, I'm going to tell you something. We hear a lot about Quinn Ewers and Xavier Worthy and, and, and Adonai Mitchell and the offense and all these guys and where they're going in the league. Tavondre Sweat was their best player front to back, man. That Texas run defense, when they had games, especially when Ewers was hurt, that they had to win in the trenches, run and stop the run. Jonathan Brooks, C.J. Baxter. But on the other side, man, Sweat, he – you want a plug-and-play run stopper this yeah. year in round two that's going to immediately make your run defense a lot better, it's Tavondre Sweat. He, he, it reminds me kind of a little of another PFF favorite from back in the day, big Damon Harrison mm -hmm. for the Jets yeah. and the Lions all those years. Just a, just a monster, especially, I'll tell you what, the Kansas State game, there's no way they win that game without him. Yeah, he, He's just so big in the middle. A top-10 pass rush grade, too, with an 85.3. Mm -hmm. Him and Byron Murphy combining inside – that was actually the engine of this Texas team. The offense did what they did. I get it. They were explosive, make plays after the catch. But their run defense, starting with Sweat, held the entire defense together. I, obviously, eventually, their undoing was their secondary. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of teams in the Big 12 that can run the football, and Texas shut them all down, every single one of them. Ollie Gordon in the conference title game had what? 20 yards, 30 yards? I, I, yeah, I'm something like just that. looking that up right now because, yeah, he, it, he did yeah, not well, do much. When he'd been going for like 160 a week, I mean, there, Tavondre Sweat in the middle was just unblockable. He, even for, like I mentioned the K-State game, even for a guy like Cooper Beebe, just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Just the best player, consistently the best player on the field all year for Texas. Yeah, 13 carries for 34 yards was Ali Gordon in that oh. game. Like, just... The guy who's been like, – we'll talk, we talked about Ali Gordon already. He won the Doak Walker Award, who's just on fire. He had 34 yards in the biggest game of the year for Oklahoma State. So, uh, yeah, Devondre Sweat, man, it, it's unbelievably dominant. And you mentioned him. Mean, he had like a 14.6% pass rush win rate too, which is like 11th uh, in the Power 5. So still a, a, de a pretty good pass rusher too. But, yeah, run defense is where he makes his money, man. Um, that's where we make his money in the NFL. Uh, number eight uh, is Marvin Harrison Jr., the wide receiver from Ohio State. So last year – he was snubbed for the Blitnikoff Award. Jalen Hyatt won it. Harrison should have won it. 
Uh, Harrison took it home this year. Um, you know, Dalton and I will probably disagree with that We because we'll show you in a, just a little bit with a couple receivers ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr., but Harrison was still a stud this year, man. Uh, 3.44 yards per route run, third most by a Power 5 receiver, also tied for third among all receivers in the country with 14 receiving touchdowns. He was still as dominant as ever, where, whereas you look at a guy like Emeka Buka, who was phenomenal as a sophomore with C.J. Stroud as his quarterback, and then took a step back. Obviously, injuries played a part for him, but took a step back as a junior. Harrison was still a superstar, so that just shows how good he was. And look, we like Kyle McCord, and that's what I do now as Syracuse's quarterback, but you have to admit, it was a big step down from C.J. Stroud. And you see how good C.J. Stroud is doing now in the NFL, and Harrison's still just as good, basically. So, whereas the next two receivers that we'll talk about in just a second uh, have elite quarterbacks throwing to them, Harrison didn't really have that this year, and yet he was still a really, really dominant receiver. And I still think he should be the first non-quarterback selected in the NFL draft. So, Marvin Harrison Jr., again, superstar receiver, has been that way for two years now uh, and will probably go down as one of the best receiver prospects that we ever see in the NFL draft. Yeah, I agree. And I'll tell you what, all three of these guys that we're talking about here, I, I think you could argue that all three could go in the top 10 of this draft. Yeah, and and that's how good Harrison is. And then it shows you how good these other two guys are. And this is not, this doesn't at all reflect the order that we might draft them in, but mm -hmm. the order of the production in the season that they just had. I'm exactly. going to go with the second yeah. one here at seven, Romo Dunze from Washington. And just a freak, man. Just a freak. 80 yards in all but one game, 100 yards in. 10 of his 15 games, just just ridiculous. That's, uh, the most ridiculous number I found, I didn't even realize. I knew he was like big and great at contested catch. He caught 21 out of 28 contested oh, targets, geez. which is disgusting. I mean, 50-50, <laughs> honestly, like when it comes to contesteds are like, that's that's like good. That's kind of the goal. Obviously, they're 50-50 balls. He caught 75% of them. <laughs> I, I mean, just any time that it's almost like any time that Washington ran out of ideas, it was, okay, just throw it to number one. Yeah. Or even against Washington State, give it to him on an end around. He's, Romo dude's a special. He's a special, special player with a big-time frame, big-time body control. Obviously, the ball placement from Penix helps, but there was not a better, like, just size, body-dominant vertical receiver in the country this year than Odunze. He was, he's just a matchup nightmare he's special he makes contested catches he's as good a vertical receiver as there is in the country i i think when you think about in that sense like an even better version of t higgins um some people have thrown the Devonte adams comp mm. in there um I, I think the the route tree in the short game might need just a tad bit of work compared to harrison and the next guy we're gonna have but um as good if you just need a guy who you can just chuck up the ball to 50 50 there's nobody better than odunze no absolutely not man he was phenomenal for for washington this year and yeah i mean i don't know if you saw daniel jeremiah who's one of the best draft analysts in my opinion in, in the game he dropped his uh top 50 big board today he had roman dunze number three overall on his big board behind caleb there, and there's, I'll, Jr. I'll tell you what nobody nobody executes a back shoulder better than Odun say it's yeah. it's it's actually a big reason that he gets the Adams comps nobody in college football does the back shoulder better than him it's not even close dude if he's anything like Devontae Adams he's gonna have a very very long and, and really legendary NFL career honestly so yeah Roman Dunes at number seven uh fantastic another guy man Joe Alt at number six Notre Dame from Notre Dame the office tackle he what he's done in his career is stupid man stupid I mean as a true freshman he was so let's just preface it with this. So I, we actually interviewed Joel, too, if you want to check out that interview. He's the son of John Alt, who's a Chiefs Hall of Famer, legendary office tackle for the Chiefs, played like 13 years for them. Uh, Joe, in high school, only played one game as an office tackle. The rest of them were at tight end. He even played a little quarterback, too. So he was very you know new to the office tackle position until he got to college. So you would think, especially offensive line, Offensive line is a position where, like, okay, you really don't want true freshmen starting right away. You want them to sit for a year, get their weight up, especially a guy like Joe Alt, who was playing tight end in high school, get their weight up, get acclimated to the college game. He started in his sixth game um, as a true freshman, and he was fantastic, man, at, at left tackle for Notre Dame as a true freshman. I think he had, like, a 78.8 grade that year, which was one of the highest we've ever seen by a Power 5 true freshman offensive tackle i believe i'm looking at him right now so yeah panay sewell peter skoronsky and akema kwanu since 2016 only ones that had a higher grade than joel all of them were 
top 15 picks in the NFL draft. So, I mean, Panay Sewell right now is like maybe the best tackle in the NFL right now. So, and then as a sophomore, Joe Alt led the nation in overall grade and run blocking grade and was the most valuable tackle in the nation as well. So, he was what made the leap from a, a really good true freshman tackle to the best tackle in the country as a sophomore. And you can make the argument, man, he was the best tackle in the country again as a junior this year. Um, he uh, had the only only tackle in the country with 85 plus grades as both a pass blocker and run blocker this year. And his 91.2 pass blocking grade was second among FBS tackles, only behind Patrick Paul from Houston. So after leading the nation in run blocking grade as a sophomore, he was second in the nation in pass blocking grade as a junior. I have always been on this train. I think Dalton, you've been on this train too. I don't think it's an argument. I think Joe Alt is clearly the number one tackle in this year's draft. Trevor Sikuma actually now has Joe Alt as his number one tackle. I believe Connor Rogers does as well. Um, I, I think a lot more people are coming around on this and having Joe Alt above Olu Fashanu as the number one tackle man. Just because you look at the production from Joe Alt in his three years of college football, it's a lot like Brock Bowers, man, where it's just like, dude, he's just been dominant for three years now. Um, and who's to say it's not going to continue in the NFL? So Joe Alt got the bloodlines, got the size, got the athleticism that you look for. And then just elite, elite production as both a pass blocker and run blocker. To me, it's not even a debate. I think he's clearly the top tackle in this year's draft and clearly a, a top five or a top ten pick in this year's draft as well. Yeah, I think I think you'd be talking about him. I actually think in a in a year where you had less um, quarterbacks and receivers and flashy stuff, I think he'd be top three. I think in last year's draft, he he would go top three. Um, he's agreed. I think it's the well-roundedness. It's it's the stat you mentioned about eighty-five plus in both in both facets. Uh, that's no other just just no other tackle in this draft. You see, Fashanu's a great pass protector, yeah. right? Fawaga's a great run blocker. Um, alt alt is everything. I, I and you know you mentioned high school background, tight end, quarterback, that stuff. Uh, that that gives me echoes of Lane Johnson, and we know how yeah. good Lane Johnson is. I believe Lane Johnson was a quarterback in high school and went to started out, I think at Oklahoma as a tight end. And obviously I, I, I think Lane Johnson should be a hall of famer one day. Um, I, I think Joe Alt is actually, I think he's going to be the safest pick in this. If somebody, to, if somebody asked me, they went, who's the single safest number one die on the Hill pick in this draft. I actually think it would be Joe. Alt. Um, and it, I don't, it's, it's the well-roundedness. Yeah. It's, it's the, 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 the high level of play in run and pass. Um, that gets it done for me. But I'll give you to somebody else who's well-rounded right now. How about Malik Neighbors mm -hmm. from LSU at number five, man? Deep threat, slot threat, after the catch threat, everything, everything. You know, and we're we're gonna get to we're gonna get to his quarterback here in a little bit. But Malik Neighbors, I think for both of us, was the best receiver in the country yeah. this year. Uh, Ninety-nine point nine deep receiving grade, obviously tied for best in the country with a handful of others. Best receiving grade overall in the country. One of the best slot receivers in the country. Um, only Brian Thomas Jr., his teammate, had more touchdowns, led the country in yards. I mean, there's only so much we can say about Malik Neighbors before just saying that he should have won the Bolitnikoff. Yeah. Best best receiver on the best offense in the country. They probably just didn't want to load LSU with all of the offensive awards, but you certainly could have. Mm -hmm. He's just so good. I, I, Max, I'm going to tell you. I, I I actually think his route running rivals Harrison. Um, his yeah. his when I was watching his tape uh, a week or two ago, his like his hip turn and the suddenness mm -hmm. of the top of his routes is is just filthy. I, I I don't actually know. I don't actually know how you cover Malik Neighbors. I really don't. He can the release is off the line. I, I the, just the. The agility and how fluid it is. I'm tell I don't think there's I, I don't know how many receivers I've seen turn turn their hips quicker than Malik Neighbors. And then the stop and start. You talk about a guy who can who can get you moving on that sixteen yard curl mm -hmm. like and at the top of the route and just stop and leave guys just still backpedaling. I, I he he's got it all. I'm telling you right now, he's got it. Whoever gets Malik Neighbors has got an absolute stud and he was the best receiver in college football this year 
Dude, it's been really cool to see his progression because as a sophomore of the year before, he was excellent yak receiver, but he still kind of had to develop as a route runner. This year, Manny, you just developed to the best receiver in college football, honestly. So, yeah, I, I love him. Um, you said it before, I, I think all three of the guys that we just talked about in the top 10 here of our list in Harrison, Odunze, and Neighbors should all be top 10 picks in the NFL draft as well. I, I think Malik, Malik Neighbors, I've seen a lot of DJ Moore comps for him. I kind of love that comp too, but yeah, man. Oh, Neighbors. he's faster. Neighbors is faster than yeah. Moore. He's even faster Absolutely. than Moore, yeah. Yeah, I, I love Malik Neighbors, man. I agree. I, I think they kind of gave it a Harrison as kind of like a, hey, sorry for screwing you over last year with Jalen Hyatt. Uh, th they gave him the Blitnikoff this year. But, man, with Neighbors, it, it's hard to argue that Neighbors is not a better receiver than Harrison this year. So I, I'm the best in college football, honestly. So Malik Neighbors at number five. Uh, number four is Bo Nix, the quarterback from Oregon, who really just a cool, really awesome story, man. This guy was a five-star recruit coming out of high school, went to Auburn. His dad, Patrick, was the quarterback at Auburn as well. Um, so everyone was excited. He's the next Knicks quarterback at Auburn, five-star recruit, number two quarterback in the country. And let's face it, man, his three years at Auburn were pretty lackluster. 63.1 uh, grade as a true freshman, 73.4 grade as a true sophomore, 78.5 as a junior, so a little bit better. But, I mean, he was getting booed off the field by Auburn fans. They wanted him benched um, when he ended the transfer. Like, it was almost, So one thing that I, uh, that I talked to him about in our interview with him was that, you know, one of the jokes was Auburn fans would have is that, hey, this is the year. Bo Nix is going to win the Heisman. He's going to win it all. going to win the net, all that. It was a joke to them. They're like, oh, he's, he's not actually going to do that. But he transferred to Oregon. I, among the, the people, are saying, man, I don't, I don't know about this for Oregon. Like, I don't, Dan Lanning, I don't know about this for, for him, man. But immediately at Oregon, just changed everything he was. Where at Auburn, he was this gunslinger, just like running around, making crazy plays. Sometimes it'd be unbelievable plays. Sometimes it'd be unbelievably bad plays. At Oregon, he just turned into this like efficient uh, killer, man. Just a killer. Just He was fantastic at Oregon. Played really the point guard role in that offense as his, in his first year there. And then this year, he had the highest passing grade in college football this year. And all of a sudden, that joke about Bo Nix winning the Heisman Trophy, whereas it was a joke at Auburn, he was a Heisman finalist this past season. So really cool story for, for Bo Nix to go from you know where he was at Auburn to now at Oregon and, and being a probably first round pick in the NFL draft as well. Um, he led the nation in turnover worthy play rate at only one percent, which is crazy considering what he was doing at Auburn when he was putting a the ball in harm's way. It seemed like in every single play. Also led the nation in adjusted completion percentage as well, which is your completion rate plus any drops your receivers had right around eighty five percent this past season. So Bo Nix, man. Really cool story and one of the best quarterbacks in college football, and he will be a quarterback in the NFL now, which if you asked me two years ago, would that be the case? I would say absolutely not, but it's super cool now to see what Bonix has done and to, uh, to really just improve his career, man. Yeah, I think it just goes to show you that that fit is a huge thing too, right? I think if you get in a better system, you get with the right coaching staff, you just, just get in the right situation for yourself. And I think it's the same thing when we make all these arguments about these quarterbacks going into the NFL now, what's the best fit for him, too? Yep. I, and I think that's – and I, it works the other way. You know, when you're talking about debating between different guys at the top or even in the middle where it's like, which guy actually fits us best? Because they're all very close in talent. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. The talent level is very, very close. I know it's kind of assumed that, you know, Caleb Williams is the guy and then there's everybody else, but it still has to fit. It has to fit your offensive coordinator, has to fit your play calling, has to fit the receivers, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So Nick's finding the right fit in Oregon for two years. It, it, it really it was unreal to watch. I mean, just as efficient as it gets. But I'm, I'm going to go with next the one guy that he couldn't beat, the one guy he couldn't beat, 0-3, man. But Michael Penix Jr. at Washington, similar story. All the injuries at Indiana – um, coming back from them, finding the right fit. Kalen DeBoer bringing him into Washington. As you know, he was already familiar with them at Indiana. The best play action passer in the country, first of all, 93 passing grade on play action. As good a vertical passer as there is in the country if he had time in the pocket, taking advantage of the elite, elite weapons he had. Um, Penix, I mean, to me, I think this year, the best pure pocket passer in the country. Mm -hmm. I, I think Dr Drake may would probably be the other guy that, that we would talk about right there. Michael Penix, when he had protection and I know the last game, everybody thinks, Oh, he got exposed against Michigan. Find me a quarterback in the country. That's beaten that Michigan defense. Nobody, nobody's doing it. So I, I don't, I actually don't take a ton of stock 
in the last game against Michigan. He missed a few throws. Yeah, there was one to Odunze in the second quarter that stands out as a miss. But I, there was nobody. Nobody was. I don't. I'm not sure. I don't think Jaden Daniels would have beat that Michigan team. I really don't. I, I just. I don't. I think to judge him off that game is so so unfair. Yeah. Because I'm seeing people now. Well, he can't handle pressure. He's a third round pick. Or uh, did I see somebody say that there's some scouts that wouldn't even touch him, wouldn't even draft him? And I know part of that's the injuries. If Michael Penix doesn't go in the top, at least the top 20, if he gets by Pittsburgh, I think at 18, that's a travesty. Mm-hmm. I, I I would not understand that at all. This guy is as good. He might actually, considering his experience like under center, he's the only guy in college football this year that I saw. Like He actually wears the wristband and calls plays like mm-hmm. NFL style. They don't they, they don't do the cue cards and like and all that like he ran an NFL offense at Washington under center wristband calling plays changing protections making decisions based on the defense's looks like this was not like scripted hey throw it to this guy he ran an NFL a legit NFL offense at Washington and got took Washington two years ago they won four games <laughs> and in two years in, with Penix they lost what three yeah. It was a right? national the, championship the, game. I yeah. mean, like the only team other than what Georgia to beat Oregon, mm-hmm. just just crazy. I mean, Oregon. I think what is it? The other two years they were what? Other than the Washington games, was it like twenty two and one? Probably. And he yeah. went three and zero oh against them. Yeah. And and care. I mean, Michael Penix Jr. changed the program at Washington. He's one of the best players in the country. Deserved every bit of the Heisman runner up. And, and if you think he's not one of the twenty best players, at least. In this draft, I really don't know what you're looking at. Yeah, I agree, man. It's so Steve Palazzolo, who we love here, uh, had a great tweet after the the Michigan game where he was saying, "Man, if Michael Penix Jr. Op- if Quinn Ewers completed that hail mary at the end of the game, that would have been the best thing for Michael Penix Jr.'s stock because the last thing that we would think about with Michael Penix Jr. is, man, he tore up Texas in that game. It, it's not fair. I know it's not fair I go. to I judge know. any to, to to judge anybody against that Michigan defense is is not fair. At the only the I think the only guy that I have any takeaways from is from that Michigan defense is Marvin Harrison because he still shredded them. Yeah, he still did. He, he's like and Odu- I know, to be honest with you, Odunze was still getting open. Penix had a few misses, but they just could not pass protect. No, they couldn't. So you mean you mean to tell me and and we always talk about clean pocket stuff is more stable than pressured stuff, right? It's mm-hmm. why we still believe in Caleb. Yep. When when Penix was clean in that game, missed a couple, but like it was still there. I, I mean, I, I you cannot judge anybody. I, I, you don't have to throw it away like totally if you don't want to, but you cannot take the judgment in the mission. Nobody was beating Michigan. Nobody. We had, we had no, s- and I'm and I'm the idiot that picked them to lose in like their three <laughs> biggest games of the year. Yeah. I did. I, I, you know what? I, I doubted them. But when you look back at Michigan's, that's the best defense in college football in the last four years. Yeah. Who was? T- tell me. Find Ooh. me a quarterback who was beating that Michigan defense. Well, I think night. I think no. the, Georgia, the Georgia the Georgia defense probably from two years ago. I probably put higher. I think they they were the only ones I might put higher than Michigan. But by, by the grades, it's the best one we had since 2019 Ohio since the Chase Young Ohio State. Yeah, I think I, I think it has a lot to do with the Big Ten though too. But I I, I think it's close. I, the Georgia one just in terms of the talent they had was crazy. And Kirby Smart there, there was too. There was not there was nobody not not Georgia. Not Bama, obviously. Not Oregon. Not I don't. Not LSU. Not anybody. There's not a soul that would have gone out there and shredded that Michigan defense. No, no way, dude. We Absolutely had so I'm not. looking at right now. We no. had six Michigan defensive players in our top hundred one list right now. Six. Yeah, and, they, and over well half deserved. the starting line. And honestly, oh, absolutely. Junior Colson, we didn't have any either. Junior Colson could have been in this list too if we, if we wanted to. There's so. probably three more guys you, we could have had in. Keon there, Sab either. with the safety, we didn't have out here either. I don't, Rod, Rod Moore. I think, I think we this. were thinking about Rod Moore, and we just barely left him out. <laughs> it was, we could have had nine uh, Michigan uh, defenders on top. They of got one they got freaks. They got freaks, and they had the best scheme in the country. I, there was Dude. to if. To judge Penix off of that game is so un- is so unfair. I can't even. Jesse Minter. Jesse really Minter's an NFL defensive coordinator now. Like yeah. you, like uh, yeah. So I agree. Yeah, um, yeah. I I, just, I thought that tweet from Steve was pretty funny. He's like, dude, if if Ewers completed that pass, we would say Penix should be a top ten pick because everyone was freaking out over the Texas game. And then, yeah, the roller coaster with Michael Penix Jr. is crazy. Like we all knew who he was. Um, and I, I think we still know who he is now, which is a first round pick. But uh, it's actually pretty interesting, Dolan. Our top four players all have super awesome comeback stories, honestly. 
Bo Nix going from a lackluster career at Auburn to great at, at Oregon. Penix, two torn ACLs, shoulder injury at Indiana, four season-ending injuries in Indiana, flamethrower at Washington. At number two is another guy, Liatu Latu, actually started his career at Washington, which if you think about that, man, imagine Liatu Latu and Braylon Trice we had, I think, in our top 20. Imagine those two <laughs> two edges coming off the edge for Washington. They might have won it all, honestly, if, if they had Liatu Latu this year. Uh, but Latu at Washington, uh, going into his sophomore year, had a neck injury in fall practices and that following that year, the team doctors at Washington said it was too risky for him to continue playing football. So he medically retired at Washington, transfers UC to UCLA. The physicians there at UCLA say, okay, you, you're cleared. And man, was he dominant. He was fantastic last year for UCLA. And he was maybe the best player in college football this year. You can make that argument. He actually don't. He had a 96.3 grade this year. And if you're thinking that's high, you're correct. It is the highest mark we've ever seen by a Power 5 player. Not a Power 5 edge defender, Power 5 player since we started in 2014. Number two was Blake Corum, the running back from Michigan last year at 96.2. And then Kyle Pitts, Chase Young, Quinnen Williams all had a 96 grade in their final seasons. All of them were top five picks in the NFL draft because of it as well, because of how dominant they were. Uh, if you remember how dominant Pitts, Young, and Williams were, I mean, man, they were superstars. Latu was the highest graded Power 5 player we've ever seen at PFF. Led the nation, led the Power 5, excuse me, in pass rush win rate at 27% uh, and pressure rate this year at 21.4%. So, Latu, Latu, man, 96.3 grade, best defensive player in college football. Maybe, I mean, he's dominating the Senior Bowl right now. It should not be a surprise. Just a super awesome story, man. Going from a guy that we thought his career was over at Washington and now transferring to UCLA. A lot like, in my opinion, Jalen Phillips. Remember, Jalen Phillips had to medically retire at UCLA, transfers to Miami. Kind of the opposite story where Latu's going to UCLA. Uh, and Phillips, I mean, killing with the Dolphins. Unfortunately, injuries have kind of taken uh, some of that away from him, but still doing a really good job with the Dolphins. I think Latu could have a similar kind of impact. Kind of reminds me of the same... They play a lot similar, too, I think, him and Jalen Phillips. So uh, I love Latu Latu, man. You can make an argument he's edge one in this draft, but you can make, he definitely was the edge one in college football this year. Yeah, and I think the thing with Latu is he's going to have some scheme versatility, too. If you want him to stand up or have his hand in the dirt, that's a similar thing to Phillips as well because there's been times when the Dolphins have run a 3-4 and Phillips has stood up. Yep. Um, other times, like this year with Fangio, more of a four-man front. Um, but – no, when you're mentioning a guy in the names within the names that you just mentioned, Chase Young, Jalen Phillips, Quinn and Williams, I think about Aiden Hutchinson too. Yep. Uh, no, he, he's he's that good. I mean, he's another guy. Um, like in last year's draft, would have gone in the top five, absolutely. Yep. And this year, he's there. Somebody. This is the thing I keep saying about this draft. Somebody is going to fall into the teens that should not yeah and 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 i don't think because ucla didn't have the year especially offensively they were supposed to i think they only went seven and five is that right maybe eight and five after the bowl mm -hmm. game um offensively they weren't quite they were they were honestly one of the five best defenses in the country i, I think you know when you talk about michigan ohio state uh and you might be able to put ucla like right behind them honestly their front seven was so good and he was the best among them um a historic year for him just one of the best players in college football throw the tape on he's going to be the guy that like everybody goes oh the more i watch tape on him the more i love him like he, yeah you know we talk about jared verse and dallas Tur latu's just as good if not better than those guys it would not shock me at all if he was the best nfl player of all these edge rushers and he just had a historic year but i'll tell you our last guy had a historic year too max and we've we've been on this for a while um Jaden daniels man lsu heisman winner you know, the best overall grade for a quarterback since Mac Jones in 2020 finishes his career with the best rushing grade of any of any power five quarterback in PFF history. I think Malik Willis was the only one. Maybe there might be one other guy. I can't remember. Malik Willis had a better rushing grade, but in the power five, nobody better than Daniels. Just um, just it's hard to even quantify the level of improvement throwing football this year. Always been a really good runner, even at Arizona State. Dangerous, dangerous athlete. And was always safe with the football. This year, Max nearly tripled his big-time throw rate. Mm -hmm. um, nobody, nobody, nobody throws a better slot fade. Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors. It, it was it, death and taxes, and those two complete the slot fade, man. It, it's they, He was so good vertically down the field. 
Um, and, and even to be honest with you, you see the thing like people talked about Lamar Jackson this year of, oh, he, he made the improvement of like kind of sitting in the, you know, with poise in the pocket, looking to throw, looking to throw, and then taking off north and south when it was time to run with kind of the right time. Daniels does that now. When he, when he gets north and south running, mm-hmm. there is not – running back, quarterback, I don't care. There is not a more dangerous runner in the country than Jaden Daniels. All right, and, and now he put the vertical passing game together along with keeping the turnover-worthy play rate down. Only seven all season. Yeah, seven turnover worthy plays all season, and I think three of those were fumbles, three mm-hmm. or four of them. So, just, I mean, you, he made almost no bad throws all season. Made every throw in the book. Can throw with timing. Can throw it vertically. Um, quick release. I, I think the ball placement, like, and this is like nitpicking now on ball placement. It like the our accuracy metrics is probably closer to like B plus. Yeah, but if if you give me the explosiveness with the arm and the feet, I will take. I will absolutely take. There are there are certainly less accurate guys who have succeeded in the NFL. I think about you know Josh Allen and guys like that. But no, Daniels Daniels was a full package this year. Man, he was the best player in college football. I actually don't. I'm I'm not sure it was close. No, I don't, I don't was, think it was close either. When you take into account, he and Penix and Nix said this, and this is when we made the Heisman arguments had nearly identical passing numbers. Yeah. And then and then Daniels ran for 1100 yards. <laughs> yeah. It's just not no, it wasn't you watched the Missouri game. You know you know when it was for me honestly and I was like, "Wow, Jaden Daniels getting a lot better. He took over the Missouri game. They they he took over the old Miss game and and Dude, honestly they gave up 50 the Florida five, game 50, was the, well, the Florida the the yeah. the 80 the 85 yard run against Florida, yep. 80 85. What whatever how 80 yard run against Florida. I would I immediately. I, that's not normal. Yeah, <laughs> quarterback max quarterbacks don't have eighty yard runs. I know it's not a thing. And when I and, and when I tell I I don't know if he's going to run at the combine, but I sure hope so. Yeah, because he's I I that looks like a four three to me. I, that that I knew he was fast. I knew in the Missouri game he was fast. You could see it. He just glides, man. He's one of those mm-hmm. gliders. No, that Florida that was track speed. That was different. Yeah, that was not. That's not like oh like. Oh, we talk about like Drake May and even Caleb. Caleb's a great athlete. Like, oh, these guys are athletes. Like, no, this is that's like track. Jalen Jaden Daniels could run track. Yeah. Like he's not he's not normal. I'm just gonna keep saying it like that until people figure it out. And I think the start do he is not normal. And I'm I'm gonna die on this hill that you could take you could take any of those three guys first overall and justify it. Yeah. I know and, and Jaden Jaden got himself and now some people are gonna go, Well, one year wonder this no, he was good. Yeah. before okay if you're doing the one-year wonder thing like kenny pickett kind of had a one-year wonder thing mm-hmm. you know he got jordan addison that last year and went crazy no this is different Jaden, it's a whole different level athleticism what you want right now in a quarterback when you think about lamar and mahomes and let's be real even brock purdy this past weekend what's the best thing you did take off running yep you, you you need that sort of athleticism and daniels when daniels gets north and south I, i'm I'm scared. I wouldn't even know what to do. Yeah, dude, he he was phenomenal. I mean, Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, another interview we have as well. Um, and, and again, like I mentioned before, I like how the top four guys have all really cool stories. Man, he was bad at Arizona State as a passer, especially. He's always been a great runner, but as a passer at Arizona State, he had 67.8 grade as a true freshman as a passing grade, 62.2 as a sophomore, 70.7 as a junior. Um, just never was a good passer. And even when he transferred from Arizona State, there was this viral video of his teammates. I don't know if you saw this, Dolan. Teammates cleaning out his locker after he announced he's transfer or ending the transfer portal, cleaning it out, and you could overhear his teammates saying, "This guy's trash, anyways. Don't worry about it. We're gonna be fine. This guy's trash. He's trash." I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you too. I, those were not the best teams he was playing on. Either. No, uh, it's it's he had that IU was for if a you, little bit. you look at some of the numbers and the grades for those those eras. On top of the fact that he was the freshman sophomore guy playing it even like 2020 they played four games i can't take anything out of 2020 when they played four mm. games and COVID and all that as a freshman and sophomore on a team i mean look where look, arizona state they haven't gotten any better without him if he was so bad you would think oh they get somebody else in there and they're better they haven't gotten any better without him i know they no. showed some fight this year but that you know were they winning three games a year because of Jaden daniels i don't think so no 
But yeah, that's just, and then so I mean, it's just funny, man. When they're like, call, the, his own teammates are calling him trash and saying we're gonna be fine without him. Goes to LSU, first year there, really improves as a passer, but really is because he just cut down on the turnover worthy plays, which is very safe quarterback. Was not taking too many shots downfield. Played very very safe and played an effective brand of football last year. This year, man, he was an assassin. All of a sudden, the like you mentioned, the big time throws go up. The turnover worthy plays stay down as they've always been, um, and he's still an elite rushing threat too. So he was again. I think this is one of the best Heisman seasons we've seen in, in a long time. I think it's just people are not saying it because LSU went nine and three this year when really it's because of the defense being horrible. LSU had the best offense. One hundred and forty-two points in those three losses <laughs> they gave up. One hundred and forty-two points. Like what forty-seven a game? I think it was or something like that. I, Man, I it's it was, just like it was fifty. It was fifty-five against Ole Miss, and I think. Was it 45 against Bama and 40, yeah. 42, 42 against some of whatever the third? Uh, oh, Florida State. Yeah, that's Dude, what he Florida was, State And game. before he got hurt, he was like torching Alabama a little bit too. Like, yeah, like that. you can't do that to Alabama like, with that secondary that they have. And he was no. getting it done, man. The, so. fl- the Florida State game, which again tells us how good their defense <laughs> and the rest of their team was, committee. Uh, the Florida State game was the only game where Daniel struggled. And that was the first game of the year. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I, I that's that's the part. Of, again, that's a, another case I would have made three months ago. Is hey, they only gave up twenty four points to Jaden Daniels. Yeah. Like, what you don't? It's, this is not one of the four best teams. In, anyway, sorry, I'm done with that. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> but yeah, no, just 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 an incredible season. Best offense, best player in the country, no question. Dude, easily. I, I made the comp before, and I love the comp. I, I don't think it's a play style it really fits, but it's just a career arc. I think it's perfect. It's like the Jalen Hurts, man, where Jalen Hurts at Alabama, great runner, struggled as a passer, as a lot like uh, Jalen Daniels, too. Like Struggled with accuracy at Arizona State, but he's always a great runner. Jalen Hurts transfers to Oklahoma. All of a sudden, it's this elite passer, uh, Daniels transfers to LSU, all of a sudden is a lead passer. Hurts gets to the NFL, continues to compound on that, continues to improve with the Eagles, and now he's the MVP candidate almost every single year. I think Jane Daniels could have that same career arc where he gets to the NFL. He might not be done improving, man. He might not. He's improved every single year of his career. He might still improve as he gets to the NFL. So I, I agree. I, I think the Patriots would be smart to probably take him with a third overall pick considering how badly they need a quarterback. Um, and I think I would really like to see that in New England. So that's what we got, man, for our top – 101 players in college football. Kind of putting a bow on the 2023 season, like I said before. Uh, we're going to get into some offseason content, some NFL draft content as well. So make sure you subscribe to the channel for all that and more. But for producer Eli back there, for my co-host, Don Wasserman, I'm Max Chadwick, and we will see you guys next time. <laughs>